Welcome to the first episode of the Washed Athlete Pod. I'm your host, Frank, along with me, my co-host, Kyle. And today we have a very, very special guest, as you can tell by the title. 2008 Super Bowl champ, 2005 Pro Bowler, entrepreneur, host of the Catch the Moment podcast, sports analyst, runs his own football camp, <laughs> Mr. Helmet Catch himself, David Tyree. What's going on, man? Frank, what's going on, man? Good to catch up with y'all. Kill it out here. Washed athlete. We in the building. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for joining. So before we uh, before we dive into your career, I want to ask you about the uh, the Giants season. Obviously, expectations were uh, were pretty low going into the season, and uh, yeah. I just want to know how would you rate your performance now that the uh, now that the season's all said and done? Yeah, I mean, like when you consider expectations, this is probably an A A performance. You know, I think that uh, I think it was it, what made it special was not just that they made the playoffs, got a win. Um, you know, shifted the culture. I think it was actually the overcoming of the injuries. It wasn't like this easy road to, to, to it was like, okay, the, the roster looked like it could have been, maybe they can get nine wins if they play great and perfect and then you lose your whole wide receiving crew and you lose this guy and you cut James Bradbury. It's just like, oh my God. So yeah, this was a really special workaround and I, I just gave throughout the season so much credit to uh, Dable and even just as much for, to Joe Shane for, for, for riding their value system and culture shift. Yeah, David, I saw you tweeted you, were, you had Daniel Jones back. You said you think he's the guy. Are, do you stand by that? Do you think the Giants should extend him? Yeah, definitely. And if if no. so, are they going to have money for Saquon? I think, I think here's, here's the reality, right? It's kind of like you, you, you can pick either one and be right. And, and, and I, I don't know if they're going to have the, the juice to get both and still – you know, continue to make their roster improvements that I believe the Giants really want to make. But um, I think Daniel Jones, he's earned the right to say, hey, man, I, I did everything you asked me to do. Um, it's tough to put down these big, big dollars for one year of great, you know, one year of greatness, right? And, and I think that's, but you know what? He, they, he bet on, you know, they, Giants didn't bet on him. He made him, he made him eat it. And I think the right number is where you want Daniel Jones. Yeah. When you worked for the Giants, were you ever a part of those off-season conversations? Or were they asking you, to, should we extend the guy? Things like not, that? Not whether we should extend the guy, but you get a chance to be a part of the conversation. You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm big into the uh, character development side, the leadership side, just really being able to give um, honest feedback. And that's kind of where my pulse is and where my feedback came. But yeah, you know, it's big dogs making big decisions, you know, so I just... Oh yeah. You know, I wouldn't say they, they utilized me to the best of their ability while I was there, but it was all good. What would you say about the the Empire State Building getting lit up green for the? Uh, what is this? that? I don't know what's it's going gross. on. <laughs> it's like a Nickelodeon slime. It was it was just gross, man. Yeah, um, I was definitely caught off guard by that. I'm all about, you know, I'm an honest guy. I try to tote the line between being true big blue and and also being a little bit of an analyst here. Yeah, I had to. I picked the Eagles to beat the 49ers, but no way in the world I'm picking the Eagles to win yeah. the Super Bowl, right? You got to have some kind of limits. The, the roster's amazing, but we're not putting up the Eagles in the, in the greatest building in, in United States history. Oh, football. Yeah, you got your man uh, Steve Spagnola Did back in the uh, back in the Super Bowl again. Yeah, it's, you know, um, Spags, I think he's just good at what he yeah. does, man. At the end of the day, um, He'll, he'll bend, he'll break, but he's really consistent. And I think the culture in Kansas City is straight on. He's been, he's been, um, he's just been rock solid. And, and like I said, you know, he's always had those, those moments where the defense gives up those holes and they get gashed. But by, by, the, by midseason, they're, they're in good form and, and playing great football in the middle of the playoff run. Did I hear you say then you're not picking the Eagles? Does that mean no. you think you think Chiefs handle yeah, it? I, I, Is that I a rivalry thing, or you don't think they're good enough? Yeah, I picked the Chiefs at the start of the season, so um, you know, like I, I didn't back down last week because of the injury. I don't think it was a high ankle sprain. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I just like come on, man. Like you know, you, you're practicing in two days on the high, three days on the high. You know, it might have been a mid, um, mid low grade sprain, but I, you know, could have been a bad sprain. Just wasn't high. So, but still, I do believe that. The, if there's only one overlooked part of Patrick Mahomes, is the it's the competitive drive, and I think it kind of gets. That's to me what makes him different. You know, and I call him the Michael jo Jordan of the quarterback position. The Giants are like you were saying before; they're pretty thin at wide receiver. Um, do you? Yeah. What I mean, what are your expectations going into the off season? You think uh, you're going to find someone through the draft, or or you think uh, there's a veteran wide receiver out there you want to try to sign? 
Yeah, I think the, I think you could explore. You know, I think you know when you look at cap breakdowns and you know like you, you got they got two big dogs that they, they, I'm sure they love to have back. And like I said, I just don't know how realistic. I'm sure Saquon Saquon is really the guy that you just want to be a giant and you want to see him thrive and do well. You know, I'm I'm always a little bit leery of, of Daniel Jones earned it. I think he earned the right, but it really is one year of like yeah of being fully persuaded, right? And it, it has very little to do with him, just as much as, as the team putting the right tools in place. But still, yeah, we, you draft the guy at six, you're looking for a culture mm-hmm. changer. So yeah, it's, it's they, they got hard decisions. I think everything else, I think you can look at some free, you know, some free agent wide receivers, it's gonna be expensive. So you really gonna, you really wanna maybe tap both wells from the draft to free agency. I think free agency might be good for linebackers. That's, that's the other big pain point. For sure. Love it. So, David, let's get into when you were playing. Your story is so exciting because you went, at least on a national scale, relatively unknown yeah. to catching that touchdown and making that famous helmet catch. And instantly, I mean, you were incredibly famous. You're still a household name. So what is that like, getting that just burst of fame all at once? And I guess, how did you handle it? You know, I could, I could be honest and say that I was kind of um... – it, it was cool for me. I think I enjoyed when you come from off the radar, not being on anybody's draft board as a junior, not really considered to have a shot to being drafted. I'm already winning. Um, you never lack in confidence as a player, but I knew I knew what my role was. I was the best special teams player in the league. You know, it took it took him three years to realize it, but I think I was that from from the moment I came in. And and I just I just knew I had more to offer. So for me, it was just about proving that. And, you know, honestly, it, it was tough. It was an uphill battle, and I was, I'm not a sexy wideout. So, um, you know, that was, that was the, really my narrative, and I finally got that, that. That opportunity was like that moment of validation. I think my teammates knew I've, I've been in training camps, coming out of the, coming out of the training camp, th- third wide receiver, my third year, and it just never panned out. So it was that moment of validation, and it sucked to not be able to. But I was, I was built for it in relation to my life. I was, you know, I was married. I'm 28 years old. I'm in the faith. I'm strong. I, I didn't have an identity crisis. It's, it's different for a young guy like a Victor Cruz and Odell Beckham, where you got the whole world and social media opening up at your at your. So it, it was great. I think it was opportunities that I that I, I felt like I was, you know, kind of prepared for, but didn't have a real plan. And I just enjoyed the ride. You know, nice little Jimmy Kimmel, Ellen, and you know, bunch of shows hit the set. <laughs> And I uh, try to get back and get on the grind, but injuries were injuries were tough right after that. It's pretty wild That's how awesome. you know they had a uh, a skit for you on SNL like immediately after Justin Timberlake putting the piece of gum on the helmet, and then you have you yeah. know, fifteen years later, you know Eli Manning. It's a helmet catch in the in the Caesars you know commercial. Like you're always relevant. You always seem to be relevant. Like it's 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 wild. And then the Super Bowl every year the Super Bowl comes around. Oh, what a catch by Tyree! It's always you like. You're almost like Mariah Carey in Christmas. Like when the Super Bowl comes around, it's like, it's like you're right back. Me and Mariah in the same Let's go. How about that? Same like, breath. Like babies no, it's wild how you, you manage to stay relevant. Like all these years later, like it's such a big moment. It's such a career defining moment. Like that's, that's incredible. Listen, I, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I never could have imagined it. You know, like it took me a few years to really realize that this was something that was like really, really historical. It's, it's neat when they first say it. Um, it's really weird when I'm, I'm, I've never been about, I, I don't really have a celebrity lifestyle. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a, I'm, I, I live my life like a regular dude. I, I, I cherish the opportunities. I cherish the favor. Um, you know, I think that the Giants fan base and community continues to hold me up. And I think all the NFL fans, it was such a moment for everyone that everybody knows. That's why we do it on the podcast. We ask them, hey, where were you? Any cool stories that went along when you saw it? So, yeah, it, it, it's just something now I'm finally at the place where being out of the NFL ecosystem, I get a chance to really build something around it and been enjoying the ride and thanking God along the way. Nice. And I noticed you have a helmet behind you. I got to ask, where is the helmet? Yeah, yeah. You know, so it, it's pretty it's pretty cool. Um, it was, I think, I, I forgot the Giants had it in the Legacy Club for a while right after the Super Bowl, but then they, the Hall of Fame asked to um, to, to hold the, hold the helmet. And I was like, yeah, yeah, because I don't think I'm going to be getting any yellow jackets anytime soon. So, you know. <laughs> Get your space. Might yeah. as well take up some kind of space in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> so, 
Uh, nice. It, it, it's better, you know. I got seven kids, so it's better to have it there. I actually have my Super Bowl uh, football right there from the from the touchdown, and you know my kids have you know like damaged it, like picked it up and thrown it. You know, it's it still it still is the ball, but I'm like, golly, dang it, you know. So uh, yeah, I'd rather have the helmet. In, in great in great condition, pristine condition, under great security, so it's it's there in the hall. Ken, did they at least let you keep the gloves? You know, there's, I got my gloves. Everything else, you know, um, it was it was wild when that whole when that whole Eli Manning and, and uh, they, they got sued for the, all the. I'm like, oh, something. There was something going on in the, in the equipment room. What's all up, says? Okay, well, this, <laughs> you know, it says. So when they when they started talking about fake autographs, I'm like, I don't know, somebody got some stuff. So I just I got a couple items. I was glad that I threw my jersey in my bag and I took that straight home. I threw my gloves in my bag, took that straight home, and uh, everything else. My cleats were never came back, and uh, some stuff like that never came back. You know, a few other uh, ex- expensive items. Let's just say. Yeah, yeah that's some valuable clothing. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, you're up. You're up against the 18 and 0 Patriots in the Super Bowl. You played them. You know the. Uh, I think it was the last game of the regular season. You played them. Um, what What is that like? What is that moment like? Third and five. Um, you know, Super Bowl on the line. You know, you're you got a top offensive line. If if I remember correctly, you have a, a pretty fragile quarterback. And from what I've heard, you know, you, you you didn't have the best practice that Friday. So like. How did everything just kind of flip where like the, the, the line breaks down, Eli somehow manages to stay up, and then you make, you know, the greatest catch in NFL history? How did that walk us through that? Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was what it was. I think we had a, a, a team that was really determined. Uh, the, the, the last regular season game, we, we gave them hell, and they were really that good. They beat us in a mm-hmm. shootout. And so I think we just we, – we, we never lacked confidence. We had great leadership. And we had a great mix of gritty guys as well. So by the time we, we get around to round two, um, and really when you think about that moment, there was nothing to think about other than going to win the game. And um, that third down was really just a – it was actually a great play call. Uh, they ran a lot of 42 coverage, four on one side, two on the back end of the coverage. And um, it was, you know, it was actually – it could have been a potential uh, shot on the post. I was running the post. Steve, Steve was running the outcut. So – not, not that really mattered because, you know, thank God the offensive lineman, they O-laid everybody. <laughs> and uh, I call Eli went Vanilla Vic on us. And, you know, I'm like, black guy who can't jump, you know. So we got two miracles in one play against, you know, one of the greatest teams ever in NFL history. And it's really just about determination. Um, you know, there's some providence in it. I don't do luck. Luck is not in my vocabulary when it comes to the catch. Because at the end of the day, um, it's not something I say I could do again. But it's something that had a lot more. It was laced with a lot more meaning and purpose than you know. Luck is finding twenty dollars walking on the street or something like that. But um, so yeah, it was it was special. It, it was special in so many different ways because it was a coming of age for Eli. It was a moment. It was a defining moment for myself. It was an integral play, but we still had to finish playing. So at the end of the day, that's what the team did. We finished. We finished the job, and we got great things done. And um, it was great to be a part of the narrative. Absolutely. So I gotta I gotta ask you. Where does that catch rank all time? What are your top three catches? We've seen some incredible catches this year um, alone. Yeah. What are your top three catches of all time? Well, when I, when I think about, you know, like this is a fun – it's starting to get a fun conversation because there, there's so many ridiculous catches these days, and, and, and it's become commonplace. But uh, when I think about mine, my, my catch, I think it's the number one because of the storyline um, just as much as the helmet catch, right? It's kind of like – I, you know, people. I'm sure they can love the debate. And if I'm sure San Antonio Holmes should say, would say he's his is the best. Julian Edelman yeah. might say his is the best. If I was just looking at standalone catches, um, I'm probably saying, um, you know, excluding myself, Odell. Um, Odell's catch is is, is is iconic from a standalone catch. Um, and this year's Justin Jefferson catch was just ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, like it was really sick. Um, and and like I said, I think the most impressive one, the only one, only catch that I felt like was really a real, it was Edelman. Mm-hmm. It was like, it was really impressive. It, it was, it was, I hate to give it to a Patriot to be yeah. in the conversation, <laughs> but um, yeah, maybe me, him, and San Antonio will put a, a catch coalition together. That's some good ones right there. 
Yeah, I'm sure there's going to be some people eager to tell you you're wrong there. Oh, but, I can't wait. But it's it's a fair list. <laughs> One other, one other quick, uh, I guess, call it ranking. I noticed you said you were the best special teams player in the league at one point. Yeah. Now I, I'm a, I'm a Bears fan, so I wanted to ask, you, you guys actually played the Bears, yeah. and Devin Hester returned a field goal. I think it was 108 yards for a touchdown. Yeah. I was gonna say, is he the best special teams player you've ever well, seen? Well, he's the best special teams return man outright. I'm, I'm on the other side of making sure Devin Hester doesn't get off, and I remember that game because. He didn't do anything on punt and kick return. And I'm like, the dude returns a freaking field goal. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I'm like nuts in my head because we did our job. And, you know, for me, I take that personal. But the guy was just, he, he, there's no one that touches Devin Hester. I was a little upset that he didn't get that first ballot Hall of Fame. I think there's just not enough respect yep. for, for the craft and what he accomplished. And he's blown out. Ryan Mitchell, who at the time was maybe the next best return man ever. It's not even close. Yeah, I mean, he, he was unbelievable because I felt like the Bears, their defense and their special teams that year, every time the offense got the ball, they had great field position, mm -hmm. which you can't really measure. It's not talked about a lot, but it makes obviously such a difference. Yeah, so yeah, that was an exciting team. I took that team. kind of stuff personal. Um, I had a three-year stretch that I could, you know, I could, I could say from my entrance to the National Football League, where I felt like I was clearly the most dominant guy. But, you know, a lot of that stuff is based on team success and other factors. But, yeah, I, 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 did, a, I did a bunch of it in college. And, you know, most guys have to learn how to get good at it, whereas for me I was, I was just built different. So I know you were a, uh, a big basketball guy when you were in, uh, you know, the, the middle school, high school era. And I know you were considering, like, going all so, so. into it. Um, or at least I was listening to that on, on one of your podcasts. Um, what do you think your path would have looked like if you would have stuck with basketball? I think, if I remember correctly, you were kind of out of position because you were one of the taller guys, but if you would have stuck with it, you would have ended up being like a point guard. So, like, what do you think that path would have looked like? Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, like I, I just had a, a whole summer where I was leaning in. I don't think I was ever been better than I was in the sixth grade. It was like, you know, I just was leaning in the practice time, the reps. Um, and I love football, and it was came, football season came around after the summer. So yeah, I mean, like it was fun. I had some fun years playing against like Syracuse basketball players in college, and and, and refining the game a little bit. But you know, yeah, you, I, I'm six. I'm six one. So at the end of the day, it wasn't going that far. And I, <laughs> I think I think the commitment level, you know, is 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 so it's so hard to be so good. You know, you have to admire so many different athletes these days, but. Yeah, the commitment level and the time frame is different. I grew up in the social era of sports, not in the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000-hour 10, 10, rule era of sports that we're kind of in right now. But I have fun with it. Um, wish I didn't, you know, sometimes I still wish I could get in a few pickup games, but I'm still raising these kids, trying to get them to their games. How was Syracuse when you were there? Did they make any Final Fours or championships? Well, yeah, my last year there was we won a national championship with Carmella. So, um Oh, nice! Yeah, before I departed, yeah, before I departed campus, we, we had we had it lit up up there. I was, I was, I was, I was. I don't know if I can remember much for the night, you know. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, I mean, like obviously it was it was some decent years. Preston Shumpert, Deshaun, you know, Jersey Boy, Deshaun Williams, um, a couple just great players up there always, of course. But yeah, Carmelo got on that scene for that, you know. It was yeah, it was a one and done. So you know, not, we didn't really kick it like that, but. It was it was great to be on campus and watch that magic finally happen. That's awesome. That had to be fun. Oh man, sick! And I think we tried to burn down Marshall Street over there. I'm sick. <laughs> Probably got pretty close. <laughs> it, was a little, it was a little wild. If you're down, let's. Are you cool with doing a little segment called this or that, where I just give you two options and you tell me which one you like better? Go for it, Chad. All right. Special teams all pro. Would you rather catch a touchdown or block a punt? Block a punt. Oh yeah. Yeah. Too, way harder. Yeah, I imagine the thrill of it too oh, when you're getting close, insane. thinking like, "Am I going to get it?" It's insane. It's way harder, especially at the NFL level. I blocked seven in college. I think I blocked two or three. In, in seven, in, Dang, in seven. Yeah. Okay. All right. Play in the snow or play in the heat, like a Miami game. Play the heat. Play the heat. Snow's messy. A lot of a lot of things you can't control. It starts getting real ugly. I'm not the most athletic. <laughs> Do you ever get used to it? I mean, did the sleeves work? Did anything work to make it not that I cold? I may have played in one snow game, and it wasn't like crazy, crazy. It was, you know, a little light light snow, maybe a little light work around. I mean, obviously, the Green Bay game was like frigid, frozen ice. 
um, on the playoff <laughs> run. That was a little different. All right. Um, play on grass or play on turf? Grass all day. You know, it's yeah. hard to make the argument for, to get away with field turf. I never had big problems, but grass is 10 times the way to go. All right. Host a podcast or be a guest on a podcast? Host a podcast, baby. You got you to refine yeah. your skills. You got to create the vibes. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, all right, I'm going to throw you a curveball here. Me, this is a debate me and Frank have been having. Who's the better play over the last 10 years, LeBron or Curry? Curry. Oh, my God. <laughs> there we, nah. Thank you. Curry. Thank That's you. Right. I'm, I'm Curry, too. Yeah, Curry. Frank's LeBron. I mean, like, I mean, like he's, the most, he's the most transformative player since Michael Jordan. Yeah. yeah I think so. It's funny. You actually compared Mahomes to uh, Jordan. I compared Curry to Mahomes because I think the way they both kind of changed the game, like – Curry brought out the shooting. Mahomes brought out that like athletic, making bad technique throws for a quarterback. Yeah. I, I think they're comparable. I like, in that I, sense. I like the comparison. I'm good with it. All right, two good guys to be compared to for no Mahomes. Doubt. All right, milkshake or smoothie? Ooh man, I'm, I'm getting older, so I'm gonna go smoothie. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to set you up to talk about your uh, clean juice. Yeah, yeah, we got like, t- tons of great options of clean juice over there in Morristown. Launched it right in the middle of the pandemic, still hanging in there. All the support is much appreciated. Hey, what's that like opening up a, uh, a store right during the pandemic? Not fun. Not fun. That's, that's <laughs> wild. Know, I, went, <laughs> I went from, you know, you know, front office position to $15 cold presser. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it wasn't anything. That, <laughs> it's kind of like this, this has been my mentality in my life. Nothing's come easy. So it definitely fit in the build of my life of, you know what, we're starting over from the ground up. Me and the family, we pulled together, had the family in there. We survived the pandemic, and, you know, it was nice to be able to finally pivot into some media work and start getting toward the entrepreneurial prospects. But it took yeah. time. It took time and had to stabilize the ship over there in Morristown. So, yeah, all the support is definitely much needed. Yeah, you have kind of mentioned how much you've been doing since retirement. Of all those things, what do you think has been the most, like, out of your comfort zone or hardest for you to do? Oh, man, that's actually... That's actually a good question. You know, I think the, um, the out of the comfort zone is probably, the, it was probably like just the, the, the demand of the small business. I love small business, but it was the demand, right? It's kind of like, at the end of the day, for me, I've always done things that are purpose driven. And, um, and, you know, business for me at this stage of my life is about influence. And, and, and of course, at the end of the day, you want to be profitable, right? You know, there's a road and a, and a pathway to get there, but there's a lot of ways to make money. Franchising is typically a way where you got to have multiple locations. We started with one. We were hoping to, you know, stay stay on board for a couple more years with the Giants. And, you know, I kind of got a, 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 I got a little disrespected out there, you know, by, by, by Gettleman's crew. So it was a little bittersweet, but it was, it, was, it was professional and you move on, you get over it. So I wasn't as prepared to take that, you know, that full-time leap, but... I'm, I'm built to last, you know, like at the end of the day, you know, you just, you just nut up. We ran a business for a year and, and, and uh, I was looking to find my way back in the media and it was great, grateful that MSG Networks has some great opportunities open and we're building, building a resume. I, I, I'm a, at the end of the day, I always feel like I'm one of the best at what I do. It just takes a little time to work your way in. Yeah, yeah. Despite whatever happened with the Giants there, I think you landed on your yeah. feet. You seem to be doing all right. <laughs> We're grinding, man. We're far from where we want to go, but just grateful for every for, for the journey. What's the uh, what's for the sure. podcast like? Now you're hopping into the podcast game. Yeah, like I said, I, I just I just love I love conversations. So I think we're not even where we want to be. You know, I think I had to start. Right, I'm pretty I'm pretty transparent. Like at the end of the day, let's just start. Um, I got an, I got so many different areas of my life that have that are just amazing. I got seven kids. We've homeschooled. We got a lot of life to talk about, a lot of life, a lot of leadership. But, of course, we love sports. I want to give my audience a little bit more stories. But at the end of the day, I'm very much into people and their journeys to success. What's your story? What's your journey? What's your pain point? What the hell did you hate to do? What are the resources that you had to funnel your way through? You know, it's like no one's just arriving there like like it was just a straight shot to the top, Mm -hmm. right? And I think success is relative, so I like to celebrate the common person just as much as the the the, the well known person. So I, I I try to create room for everybody, have dope conversations, and and, and just t- you know tell me your moment, 
and we just let it ride, man. We're letting it fly. Hopefully, we'll you know we'll we'll see about some co-hosts and other opportunities in the future. It's gonna be fun. Kind of based on the way you're talking now, and I listened to a few of your episodes too. You can't help but notice like your attitude and like how positive you are and optimistic you are. Is that just always been you? Were you like that as a kid? Were you like that as a pro athlete? I mean, or is this something you've worked? Yeah, on? I think I think the optimism has always been there. I've always been, you know what, um, you know what? If you got a teacher, she'll give you a hundred, and you work your way down. Some people give you a zero, you work your way up. I'm the hundred. You know, you violate my trust, you just lose some points, right? It's like, hey, you know, pe- people are flawed, and I think uh, my faith is definitely the centerpiece of 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 my 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 my, my belief and value structures. Like, yeah, I, I was. I've made tons of bad decisions. Best decision I made was, was was my faith in allowing Christ to get a hold of my life. And that's kind of what keeps the peace, the balance. You know, there's a lot of moving pieces with, with, with you know, raising a family, being a business owner, um, living, living, living a purpose-driven life. But you just take it one step at a time, one day at a time, and you focus on what the priorities each day. And then you add value. So I think that goes into the coaching side of my life, the leadership side of my life. And I'm excited to get to the place now I can share a little bit more of that with the public now that I'm out of the NFL ecosystem. You brought up uh, you brought up transparency. Where did you uh, where did you find or where did you arrive at the conclusion that truth, transparency, and transformation were going to be the uh, the DT three model? Yeah, it's kind of one of these deals where it's like uh, when I looked at it, it's it's like man, my life is hinged on truth. No one wants to kind of live a, a delusional life, right? Like I don't think anyone's ever trying to, but I think you grow in understanding what's actually. Co- you know, um, what's actually true. There's facts, but facts is actually a different than truth. Data, you can, you can shift data to tell any kind of story, right? Truth is consistent and tried. You know, I know people like to say your own truth, but somebody's right at the end of the day. I might be wrong, but somebody's right. And I'm, I'm humble enough to move. Transparency is about, I'm, I'm, I'm free to share my life. You know, it's just like at the end of the day, I don't have any guilt and shame. I've made poor decisions and, I, and I've learned from them and I can share them. And I'm, I don't have any skulls in the closet that I feel like I'm hiding. So it's basically saying you can see me. And transformation is about growth. You know, life is all about growth. And, um, you know, taking it from step to step, you know, faith to faith, glory to glory, however, however we like to coin it. But we got we to gotta keep moving in the right direction. So that's, that's me in essence. And that's what I like to offer. Cool. You mentioned, too, you homeschool your kids. So I guess, like, what... What drove you and your wife to make that decision? And then is that is that the most competitive gym class in the Ooh, country? Man, I wish it was, man. It's, it's, it's so hard. You know, it's, it's hard when you're a competitor. So I will say that, that, that there's two major reasons. Like, of course, as a Christian, most people think it's just all about Christianity. But I, the second major reason was who's the primary influence in my kid's life? And when you look at how much time a kid can spend in school, especially nowadays with after school activities and sports and all that stuff, you, you just kind of miss opportunities to make, possibly shape and really cultivate the relationship that you might want to have. So both were very, very important to us, laying foundation and cultivating the relationship. And we always said, we'll see where they're at, what their interests are in eighth grade and move from there. And that's kind of what the, what the game plan was. We had, this is actually the first year where all my kids are in a school um, and, and life shifted, life changed. It was hard as heck in the middle of the pandemic. You know what homeschooling wasn't hard just life you know so so that was that was and, and i wish like you know i'm the kind of guy i know what it takes to be successful athletically so if i don't see a spark if i don't see a great interest it's hard for me to buy in you like i'm not i'm not going i'm not we, we we can't be soccer mom for seven kids and soccer dad running the eight different leagues and rec leagues and going crazy so i got one of my youngest 10 year old he's got a little bit of a spark um, my older guys, they, they, they look like, you know, a little Thor. They look good. Man. They, look, they, they, they just didn't have, the, they didn't have enough humility to, to listen to that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's something, especially as a pro athlete, and you're very introspective. Like, when I was a kid, I remember trying to quit my baseball team. My dad wouldn't let me. And I know some parents, like, they push it too hard and they drive their kids too hard. I'm kind of glad that happened. I love sports. I love that I stuck with sports, and it, that kind of faded away after I was little. But is that something that's kind of hard to figure out? You make it seem like you could just see it in the kid. Yeah, I think there's some, when, when you're young, you, you want it to be their own, right? At the end of the day is, what I learned about my oldest son is he, he would do anything we told him to do. But he wasn't interested in, in it enough to make it his own. So, you know, whether we got him signed up, he'd enjoy it. 
And I think that because I think if if, if he would have played football from third grade, he probably by the time he got to the ninth grade, he probably would have been really good. But it wasn't his own, and so it wasn't worth it, right? It's kind of like I can't sit up there and watch you pick tulips while 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 the rest of these kids are digging in, right? It's not. It's like, hey man, like I want you to be in it. So I really prefer to find out what my kids were interested in. But I learned that about my oldest son. And, um, and the other guys, I think it's really, hey, man, what are you interested in? I want to support that. I want to buy into that. I want to lean into that. And most of them were, you know, I think every kid has got the you know, digitally native. Um, my, my oldest son, he's going to Air Force for, you know, for cyber systems operations. He's a stud. He's a stud. They're both excellent young men. And I think that was always our priority is who you're becoming, not what you become. When you introduce electronics into your kids' lives, I heard something interesting about this. Yeah, I, I think we, we were really intentional. I mean, cell phones, we, we, they, they had flip phones. My kids hated us. <laughs> yeah, my boys hated us, man. We, we, we were slow. Um, you know, they, they had the DSs, but, you know, the DSs hook up the Wi-Fi. I smashed a few DSs. We had a good time smashing the DSs. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a tough game. As a parent these days, you got to become like a cybersecurity expert to protect your kids. And it's, it's a challenge. So I think that um, I, my thing is responsibility is the moment you stop taking out the garbage is the moment your device becomes a liability. And, and that's kind of I'm more about response, raising men than, than cultivating the joys of little boys. And so um, I'm just purpose driven in everything I do. I think that my, my oldest son appreciates it now. Um, like I said, he's never been they're, they're, they're dynamic young men. They, you know, they, they get on a period every now and then. You know, I throw them a pack of Tampax and, you know, <laughs> and I uh, tell them to get over it. They get a little emotional and, and um, you know, but they're going to grow up and they're going to figure out life. And I think that's what my job is as, as a dad. And eventually we'll we'll all lock up. And, you know, we're, we're kind of getting that stage. My other guy's 18 and then my twin girls, they're 15. So um, the girls are a delight. You know, they, they love that. So we're in good shape. There you go. All right. Something else I was wondering about retirement. I, I, for some reason, feel like I never hear athletes ask this, but a game that's as intense and physical as football, where you really have to get into that mindset, once you retire, is there any substitution for that? Do you crave that competitive physical nature, or do you just kind of have to learn to give it up? I think it's a little bit of both. You know, I think uh, every, every individual is a little different. Um, the fact that I'll be honest, like, God was my greatest passion. Like, you know, once my life changed after my rookie year, you know, like, everything else kind of paled in comparison. I still loved the game, but it, it was a different kind of love. It was like my job, and I wanted to be the best at it. And I think that was my truest passion behind football. I mean, like, well, if really in front of football. And, 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 and I, think, um, I think everybody's a little different. You'll never replace the locker room. You'll never replace the gladiator moment of that, that you know, that 60 minutes. Of, it's just – it's irreplaceable, and and so especially the game of football is so unique. I'm like I said, I'm still an advocate, but I do understand the concerns of of emerging parents and generations. So, um, yeah, it's one of these things where if you got any fears about it, it's probably not the best arena to step into. It's a gladiator sport. Um, I love it, still love it, still enjoy it, love being a part of it, but it ain't for the week. Did you ever have any moments having a family, like where you might have got injured or got your belt wrong, and like, should I be doing this? I never had any of those moments. I had one moment that I know was an undiagnosed concussion, um, but I never had any moments. It was it was actually hilarious. I, I, I think it was a kickoff, <laughs> and I didn't, you know, I come to the sideline, I get over there, and and I I, I heard myself say something like Mickey Mouse was eating a bunch of Snickers. And, and it was just like, and then I heard myself, and, and oh, one of my teammates like, what the, hell, what the f are you talking about? And it was just like, and and I said something crazy, and the next thing you know, it was like I just kind of woke up, and it, and maybe a play later it was fourth down, and I was fine. I never, I didn't have any headaches after. I didn't have any issues. Did you stay on the field? Oh yeah, yeah. I went, listen, I, it's a different one hundred percent. Like, it was a different time. Man, it was, it was definitely my rookie year. When I actually went back and saw that tape uh, when I was in, back in the front office, and I literally was like, I was, it was like I see myself there just kind of numb for, for a few seconds. Like a good three, three second count, just like life is boom. And then it's just like life comes back in. No stumbling, just got to the sideline. But I was, I just, yes, yeah, Mickey Mouse, man, like Snickers, dog. <laughs> 
<laughs> Whatever that means. Yeah, it was it was just a real moment that was like, oh snap. And it was a different time. Yeah. Yeah, that's that feels tough too because some guys they <coughs> need every opportunity they can have. You, you see, too, certain guys get hurt now or certain guys are dealing with a shoulder injury and they could sit out a few games and it doesn't matter because they have big guaranteed money. Yeah. Is that something that could kind of mess with the locker room where there's the richest of the rich and then people just fighting to make the roster next week? It can, you know, I think, but it, like, it's always an individual battle, right? It's like at the end of the day, the guys who get drafted in the first round, they earn the right to be drafted in the first round, right? And I think... Um, based on, and there's guys who should have been drafted. It's all kind of speculation. So many things out of your control. And when it comes to the money side, at the end of the day, there's more leniency <clears throat> and room for failure when it comes to the money side. That, that was my biggest strength as a, as a player was knowing that I had a small margin of error if I was going to make the team. And um, every year I never, you know, even, even after my contract year, I knew I had about maybe one, two years where I was maybe safe because of some, some guaranteed money. But aside from that, I'm a low cap hit. So, you know, if, if I don't if I don't tee up, you know, there's there's a guy behind me. So I hedged myself and I one drop I counted as three drops. And that was kind of the way I did it. You know, like it's and, and that's kind of what gave me a middle edge and a way to create room for myself as a competitor. Yeah, that's another thing you talk about. You found your role on the team. You found how you could add value to the Giants, and that was special teams. But after that catch, I mean was the media attention and almost the expectations going into the next year, was it unrealistic? Like, how did that feel? Because I'm sure you had so many eyes on you every time you ran around. Yeah, it was, it was tough. So I didn't really get a chance to, to, to obviously build on that. It was about a month after the Super Bowl, maybe. Um, I think, you know, a freak accident. I'm sitting down, I go get a workout, trying to keep, you know, stay on it, get back, get back and stay active and enjoy the run, of course. Enjoy, but uh, I bent over, pick up a bottle of lotion, and my knee locks up, and I got to get a, 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 a meniscus repair, four to six months. So that kind of wow. timeline that close to the beginning of training camp, and that was the that was the the decline of my career. I started having the knee was strong, but I started having imbalances, soft tissue injuries, which I never had, and you know it, it was these were you know when I look at it in retrospect. I just knew, you know, God was doing something that I really wasn't prepared for. I, I was trying to build on that. I wanted to validate that. And that was, you know, if, if I could say God was good and he gave me the helmet catch, I can't say God is bad because he really <laughs> allowed me to phase out. You're very religious. You live through God. Um, what is one, you know, Bible verse or quote from the Bible that you would give to your younger self every time that you would put in your locker before you took the field? Yeah, I think uh, one of the first favorites I had was uh, that, um, you know, I think there was like, this might be like Paul, we were saying, I became all things to all men that he might by all means save some. And it was really just talking about the humility of um, making the changes necessary to serve people, right? At the end of the day, and, um, you know, the service was ultimately salvation. And for me, I wasn't raised religious. So my, my religion, you know, like when people say, you know, you're religious, I'm like, yeah, I guess so. Um, I love Jesus, <laughs> but it's it's a little different paradigm because I didn't have a church paradigm. And so I was like, I was really just into the reality that God was actually real. And so for me, that resonated because, you know, I always want to live my life through a lens of humility and, and honesty. Like, you know what? I, the only reason why I am, you know, in the faith is because I, I know I need help. It's like at the end of the day, I, I came to the conclusion that I needed help. To, 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 to excel and, and lead a better life to have more meaning and purpose and peace. And I found that. So, um, yeah, I mean, like, you know, like that's, that's, what, that's the lens that I lead, live my life through completely. And um, I just live it authentically in a way where if, if, if people have a, a, a desire to know more, then they can know more, you know, and, and I can be a conduit to that. Yeah, how was that being you kind of found God on your own time? Um raising seven kids is that something that they'll kind of challenge or they'll be skeptical about being they're not i don't know they don't really have that own time to find it on their own yeah yeah that's fantastic i think i think you know now 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 it's been for me i've been walking out this faith for 18 years now you know you kind of see enough in this whole it's challenging i think you know, when we talk about raising kids at the end of the day um you know is the the language that I, the language that i use is you know I can train my kids in the ways, but they have to choose for themselves, 
right? So at least they're going to have an idea about who God is and what he expects and, 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 and what's required of them. But ultimately, when they choose for themselves, that's when it all becomes real anyway. And, um, and so nothing's ever going to be forced, but there will be standards of hell, right? So I don't try to make it seem like my, all my kids are Christian because I think being Christian is something very supernatural uh, versus something that's just like, hey, I grew up Christian. I'm like, really? When you was, you know, out here hoeing, drinking <laughs> and doing everything? <laughs> and that's like, and I'm one of these big, like, um, there's two kind of judgments, right? I can look at your shirt and see it's, that it's tan. That's a judgment, right? Like, that's not a judgment. That's not an eternal damnation judgment. That's just like, hey, if, if, if it's blue, it has to be blue. Like, blue looks a certain color. And I think we can say, we can make those kind of conclusions about people just so that we, we're aware of what they are. If, you know, that's, that, everybody, there's a profile for everything. And I think there's certain things that if somebody's going to be genuine and authentic in whatever expression of their faith is, there's some standards that should be upheld with not with perfection but with consistency and i and i think that's what i'm committed to living and sharing um in my and in, in demonstrating my demonstrating faith that's awesome yeah i want to ask you about doing? eli manning i think eli manning gets a lot of uh a lot of hate when people bring up the the <laughs> hall of fame and you know obviously he's a two-time super bowl mvp Ooh. and you know you got guys on yeah small club very of small club and he you know you and him help rob Tom Brady of two of them. If I'm not mistaken, Tom would give up two just to have that one perfect <laughs> season. Um, but yeah. uh, what, do you, what do you have to say about that? What, what kind of person was Eli Manning, you know, in the locker room as a captain? Um, and, and what would you kind of say towards his credibility for being in the Hall of Fame? Well, he definitely deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. So I, I don't think there's even a close, close to a debate on, the, on whether he belongs in the Hall of Fame. I think the, the, the conversation is about when. You know, like, is, is he a... If I was talking as an analyst, is he a first ballot Hall of Famer? He wouldn't be a first ballot Hall of Famer for me. Um, and it's just because of, if I'm looking at things honestly, not emotionally, then I got to look at, you know, what are you, one Pro Bowl, two Pro Bowls? Um, it's kind of like when, when I'm thinking of a Hall of Famer, I'm thinking of somebody who was consistently mm -hmm. dominant. And Eli was consistently clutch in the playoffs. <laughs> you know, like it's like... He rose to the occasion, but he was also consistently himself in the toughest market in the world. For sure. And there's something to be said for that um, in relation to being that steady, that that secure, that consistent in messaging as well as um, in showing up. And I, I think that there's few tougher quarterbacks than Eli Manning. So there's a lot of feathers in his cap. But, like, yeah, it's like you, Eli was not the quarterback that lifted an average or mediocre Giants team to do great things. Like he needed, a, he needed, you know, I, I, I kind of made the comparison of Eli was, um, you know, like Cobra Command, right? It's like there was Destro. He needed Destro. He, <laughs> he needed somebody that was the muscle so that he could, he could lead the charge. But, you know, but, but yeah, he, you put the right, it's kind of like Daniel Jones. You, you, you put the right culture and the right pieces in place and you got something special. But I don't know if Daniel Jones by himself is changing the Giants altogether. Yeah. Was Eli as kind of goofy and quirky as, as the Eli we see now? I think it was all, always there. Um, you know, when I was obviously within the locker room, he was kind of young Simba, so he was just growing into that, earning earning that. He definitely had some practical jokes, you know, like, you know, the, uh, <laughs> I know he had the invisible ink going on, you know, inking, inking up jokes, gloves and shoes and goofy stuff like that. Um, I think they had some penis confetti going on. I don't know if, he was, I don't know if that was him or Sean O'Hara. Oh, it was, it was some, it's bachelorette party. Yeah, it was some good stuff. It was some good stuff, man. I mean, but yeah, he was—he he was definitely. A, I knew he was always a Seinfeld fan. So when I see his comedy, it's, 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 yeah, he was. It's, it's all there. Yeah, he's like Kramer, <laughs> no doubt. God, it looks like him. <laughs> Are we going to see you on uh, any Monday night segments with Peyton and Eli? I'm just I'm waiting for invites. You know, I, I, I've been looking <laughs> yeah. at all these jokers on. I'm like, well, they they, they they totally excluded me from the whole Caesar segment. I'm like, y'all use my moment. I, I yeah. felt like I was worthy. You know, they even got Cooper in there. They ain't got me in there. I'm like, damn, you got the helmet catching here. But you got the whole family, exclude David Tyree. But, you know, I, I'm, I told, I'm eventually I'm going to come for him. I'm going to come for him. I'm going to let him know that I'm not mad, but I'm, I'm, I'm a little, you know, I'm just saying we share the same birthday. We share a lot of stuff. We should share at least a couple of checks. <laughs> I agree. I'd love to see you. <laughs> Kyle, you got anything else for him? I was going to say that I think that about wraps up a meeting yeah. you had written down. That was fun.
It was a lot of fun, man. Y'all got a dope, y'all got a dope page, man. Y'all keep for killing sure. it. For sure. Uh, you yeah, got we any appreciate questions you, for David. Us? Nah, man, I'll get, I, I'll come, I'll, I'll catch up with you guys. Find me some social media people. Yeah. Right? You gotta, find me a team, fellas. I mean, like, show me how to do it. <laughs> no, for sure. Listen, I could, hey. I could give you all the advice for sure. I mean, I don't, I don't want to talk from a place of like having done it or anything, but YouTube Shorts, no, YouTube Shorts, it. man, I'm telling you, they're explosive. You got to get on that. Got to gotcha. get on YouTube Shorts, grind. I don't have the team yet. I need, I gotta, I gotta find, find me some, some young hungry people who want to help build the, 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 the helmet catch brand. <laughs> We'll do our best. <laughs> That's what I need. I'm young, hungry. I, I know y'all doing y'all thing. Y'all probably doing the same thing. Looking for some, looking for some young. We're young do, talent. We're doing it all Trying ourselves. We're making up as we go. You know, it's like, Bro, it's a tough gotta, game. You, you just gotta be consistent. Focus on quality. I mean, you know, you know what it is. You have, you have a producer yeah. too, right? You got a producer. No. Oh. No. Me, 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 and my wife. Listen, we're, we're like I said. You have me like this. We're grinding. We're out here grinding. <laughs> Everyone's grinding. Yeah, we all hear these shoes, right? I, love I mean, it. like, ain't nobody handing out the favors to David Tyree. They just they making me get it too. They like, how much? How much are you paying? I'm like, zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, David. Actually, the the way this kind of started, we were on my bachelor party, and I knew Frank was doing something with this brand. I didn't even know it was social media. I didn't know what it was, but I knew he was building something, and I had to like pry it out. I didn't tell anyone. <laughs> and then finally, once he told me. He had, yeah, he had way less followers than he's got now and stuff. And, like, I, I don't know. But then once he kind of, like, opened it up to me, it talked more and more, and then this thing kept growing and growing Bro. like crazy. So I mean, I now me. we're here. But I, 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 humble I, beginnings for sure. I started paying attention to social media maybe four or five years ago, and I started getting really impressed with what people's grind. I'm like, wow. And, um, I mean, I've always had ideas. But, you know, like I said, seven kids and, and life – makes it really hard to do to do social media content for sure i mean quality i would say that it doesn't make it hard to do social media it makes it hard to do quality social media you know? hey especially when you're trying to keep your kids off the internet too much yeah yeah yeah. I, you know i wanted yeah. to employ them but they you know i don't know if i can trust them to stay focused <laughs> yeah yeah so uh true nah man i appreciate y'all we'll we'll we'll, we'll connect man y'all keep crushing absolutely it. thanks thanks for coming yeah, on thanks a appreciate lot. you y'all keep doing your thing right, check in take care